Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel, Managing Misinformation in Asia. My name is Cynthia Johnson. I am co-founder and CEO at Bell and Ivy. We are a personal branding and digital marketing firm based in Santa Monica, California. Uh, I am here today with three incredible panelists. Uh, before I take the time to introduce each of them, uh, I will, I'm going to just go through how this panel will work. Uh, I will briefly introduce each of the, of the panelists and then give them five minutes to introduce themselves and to also introduce their take on our topic. Uh, from there, we go into a Q&A session. And from the Q&A session, we will stop at the 40 minute mark and allow for closing comments. So who do we have up first? We have Stephen Joe. Uh, Stephen is a journalist based in Canada. He's focused on extremism, misinformation, and politics. Uh, Stephen has worked as a reporter, a producer, and a scriptwriter for CBC, Vice, and various outlets. Next up, we have Jessica Cantor, a freelance journalist uh, focused on human rights, tech, and healthcare. Uh, she's most recently been published in Fast Company. Uh, Jessica is also an executive communications role at Bell & Ivy, so I'm thrilled to have her with us today. And then last but not least, uh, the event man himself. Uh, we have Casey Lau. Uh, Casey is the co-host of Rise, the largest gathering of tech and uh, tech entrepreneurs and investors in Asia, powered by Web Summit. Uh, to start us off, I'm going to pass the mic to Stephen uh, to introduce himself. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, thanks to the organizers for convening this uh, session. And um, hello to wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Steven. Um, for the past, say, five to six years, uh, being based here in Canada, um, I've tried to try my best to um, document, analyze, and uh, observe some of the um, issues that have arisen uh, here in my country regarding the um, uh, some reactions to, I think, what is a uh, uh, a, a global sweep of um, this discontent, uh, I would say, in some ways, from various political angles regarding the uh, globalization uh, est establishment that has um, uh, cemented itself across the world, Asia, Europe, uh, with, since the 1970s, 1980s. And um, I think it's very much, uh, these reactions um, include a lot of uh, you know, some very uh, nativist, others uh, less so uh, kinds of political organizing, political voices that have actually made their way into our uh, national uh, politics, uh, our elections and, and so on. And um, the reason I mentioned this is because I think we're living in a time where this kind of global politics um, stretching its way into our neighborhoods, our communities and so on, is directly married to, uh, to this topic of misinformation or disinformation, uh, which is deliberate misinformation for a political or social goal. Um, this is a tremendous challenge, obviously, um, given the uh, importance of uh, global tech companies, which are probably the most important, powerful entities in the history of the world. Um, everybody is obviously online, whether they like it or not. Uh, there are different kinds of platforms where various voices, regardless of who you are, um, where you are, or what time of day it is, um, you can have a voice, you can have a platform. And that's part of the democratization of um, technology and power in many ways. And um, that's just the reality now. There's no going back uh, from that. This has uh, led towards, of course, major improvements, uh, progress in terms of the speed of how messages, speech, uh, and information is passed and, and flows, particularly within a democratic context where the flow of information is really the lifeblood of um, uh, decision making. Mm -hmm. And I would say that because of that, this has uh, major implications or this has had major implications which can be observed from where I am here in uh, in Canada but in probably in many corners of the world where issues and 
this uh, dynamic of uh, anti-establishment, populist, uh, sometimes nativist, and I, this, this lump, whole lump that we call populist or far-right populist uh, movements, organizing uh, voices, politics, um, is much easily uh, coalesced, regardless of where one uh, is in the world, because of how fast information moves. And I think this, you know, this is, we can get into the, how to manage this or how this has been mismanaged, but this is something that concerns obviously governments. Uh, it's a national security issue now, uh, not just in, here in uh, North America, but of course, you know, Asia is our, uh, our focus today. Um, it has led to communal violence, for example, in India. Uh, it has led to uh, even the shutdowns of um, governments to, to shut down the internet altogether in places like Sri Lanka, for example, after the major uh, terrorist attack a few years ago. Um, do those things work? Do they not work? This is a civil society issue. It concerns tech companies, uh, but ultimately it concerns um, individual people. And that's all of this together is what makes this such a complicated issue, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jessica? Yes, thank you for having me as well. Um, as Cynthia mentioned in my introduction, I am a journalist and then I also work in communication. So I'm on both sides of um, finding you know, important stories to share, amplifying voices, uh, participating in storytelling. Um, and I actually led a webinar about this particularly last year um, at the start of you know, the pandemic about how individuals need to kind of get into uh, a mode of fact checking themselves, um, you know, checking resources and uh, finding ways that they can stop, you know, the spread of misinformation and disinformation on a, an individual level. Um, as Stephen, you know, just noted, misinformation and disinformation is impacting the health and safety in all areas of the world. Um, there's violence going on. There's a lack of, you know, people who are participating in uh, health protocols that, you know, are needed. Um, and the majority of this misinformation and disinformation spread is on social media platforms and messaging apps, as we know. Um, communities in Asia, along with other areas of the world, they use apps like WhatsApp, WeChat, Snow, and Line for many, many things, but mainly for communication between family and friends. Um, so, you know, oversight and checks and balances are needed, but with private messaging apps with end-to-end -end encryption being a major role in the spread of disinformation and the possibility of censorship, it comes down to individuals and communities needing to address this directly. So really what we need is a cultural shift. As a journalist, you know, we're trained to ask questions, to verify sources, to dig deeper and not take things at face value. Um, it may seem like a very large and daunting task to then go out and say, okay, we need to train every individual who's coming into the digital you know, age, uh, but also uh, train all of the individuals who are already participating in the digital world. Um, but really it doesn't have to be as large of a, a, a daunting task if uh, we focus on an individual and community level. Um, so yeah, in order to teach digital literacy, we need to uh, encourage people to pay closer attention to what they're being told, to what they're reading, to what they're watching. Um, we basically need to show them how to identify things that could be untrue. We need to provide them with the resources on where to go um, to find these things. And once people understand how really truly easy it is to start fact checking and making this a part of like their daily interactions with people and with the internet, um, it becomes much easier to slow the spread. Um, what we also need to be doing is um, encouraging discussions in communities about why this is needed and why this is happening and who is benefiting when disinformation spreads. For people to become active and aware, they need to know and understand the why. Um, another thing that we need to think about is how we can make people care or even trust that this is happening and that they need to be aware of it. Because people, you know, obviously misinformation is now a household topic across the world. People hear that it's happening, they know that it exists, but they don't necessarily think that they are the ones being targeted or that the messages that they're spreading to their family and friends are the issue. Um, so we really need to get to the core part of why this is happening, 
who is benefiting from it um, and teach people how easy it is to just stop it on an individual and community level. Um, one thing we do need to be careful of though is uh, how we prevent, present this information. Uh, we don't want people to kind of go to the opposite end of the spectrum and then fear everything and assume that everything is false and that no one can be trusted. So depending on you know, how this education and these awareness campaigns are played out, we just need to make sure that the messaging is you know, strong and key um, and taking a look at all levels. Um, yeah, so where will this education come from? Um, so far tech companies, you know, we know they haven't done a strong enough job in managing misinformation and removing it. So can we really trust them to lead campaigns to educate people? Uh, if we leave this in the power of the government, it could very easily lack transparency um, and we can't see the process of how decisions are being made and implemented. Um, so this could still be used to um, silence dissent and opposition, especially during elections. Uh, nonprofit and private organizations, they may not have enough reach, it could come from the WHO or the UN, but we all know that they have their own sets of limitations. Um, AI needs oversight. AI is playing a very large role in the spread of misinformation. So obviously all of these same questions come into play if we're gonna leave it in the hands of AI, who is going to um, provide that training and do that oversight. Um, basically, you know, what I'm saying here today is that the internet needs to remain a place for knowledge and innovation and a place for community, a place for business, but we have to involve everybody in this, especially the users themselves in order to come to a lasting solution. Uh, so this needs to be addressed at all levels, individual, familial, community, national, and global. Um, and the core answer here is to educate people on how to stop information, misinformation in their own interactions and family interactions and communities. I think that that's, the core value of what we need to do. Thank you, Jessica. Actually, there's a video that Casey sent before this panel that I think speaks a little bit to uh, globally where there might be some problems in, in educating people, um, mostly because of pace, right? Mm -hmm. uh, before we get into that and uh, follow up questions, Casey, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thank you, uh, panelists. And thank you to the audience for having me here today to talk about this, which I think is a very, obviously, very important topic. Um, and a lot, I, I echo a lot of things that Jessica just said. Um, I uh, work in events, conferences, technology conferences. So I am around a lot of uh, the people who are innovating in the space, but also the people who are causing the trouble at the same time. Um, I am originally from Canada, but I've spent 20 years in Hong Kong uh, building up a network there and traveling around Asia. So it is quite interesting that I'm now back in Canada and I'm, I'm able to see uh, more clearly how both sides of the Pacific are interacting with social media, how WhatsApp and WeChat really do affect um, people's lives. Um, and also mostly I've been talking to my dad a lot. <laughs> my dad who is Chinese uh, descent, lives here in Canada, and the amount of messages he sends me, um, actually nowadays, because I'm on his time zone, before he wouldn't send me so many messages because you know he doesn't want to wake me up in the middle of the night, but the ones I get from him now, I'm quite surprised at, at these um, stories that he gets from all over. He's a very educated person, but he still sees a lot of these things, and, and now he's at least, you know, because we keep making fun of him, so he does ask us, is this real, before he actually starts to talk more about it, so it's quite interesting. Um, I feel like the, uh, so we did, yeah, the, the video I passed around before was uh, Francis Haugen, the whistleblower at Facebook, and the Facebook papers that just came out, and there's going to be a lot more information on that coming out in the next little while of how Facebook, um, oh, I mean, we can just go on for hours about Facebook, but I feel like the technology people are, yes, they, ha they have a job, they have a stock price to maintain, there's all kinds of things going on in the background there. Um, but my, my look at it mostly is, um, you know, in during the pandemic, a lot of parents had to do send their kids to online school. Um, and I feel like uh, parents don't even know what that is. What is online school? It's just, uh, is it like this right now, how we're talking? Who are the people talking? Where's this information coming from? How's it being transmitted? Um, and what are the kids learning on these things? And how is that then passed around to other people in things like Snapchat? which uh, disappears after a certain amount of time, right? So you can't even track back where this stuff is coming from. Um, I'm working in the technology field, so we talk to a lot of different um, you know, innovators and futurists about what's going on. So right now it's all about Facebook, it's all about WhatsApp and WeChat, Tencent, these companies. But in the future, you know, looking at these things called deep fakes and synthetic humans that are, that the technology is growing crazy that 
Um, it's easy to, uh, you know, disregard a JPEG eventually that somebody made in Microsoft Paint or whatever, but it's going to be really hard when you're seeing, um, you know, Joe, Joe Biden or, you know, somebody, President Z or somebody saying something else um, with these kind of uh, computer uh, effects um, and people really get confused. So I think that the education level has to start now. Um, and it is across, as Jessica said, across government, across co corporations, but I feel like it's got to start in the family. I think parents have to take the initiative now, you know, the tech learning, I keep hearing all the startups are pitching, oh, education to kids, you know, they're going to be more educated than ever before, but like, yes, but the parents, I think are the ones, and my dad doesn't know the, okay, my dad's not really internet generation, but I'm thinking like, you know, for our kids today, um, we need to know what they're learning, how they're learning it, and also to teach them about this kind of thing, which I think is happening, but I feel like that is uh, my main concern, especially when I go to these conferences, and, uh, you know, talk to the attendees and listen to what they're saying about it as well. I think um, it's a very important thing that we should be all looking at um, going forward. Absolutely. I, uh, we actually uh, co-founded uh, a nonprofit about a year ago. It's a we're focused on basically uh, bridging the digital divide for foster youth because that was a demographic that wasn't touched. So when you're speaking about educating people and this will lead into our first question, it's parents uh, and then it, it's teachers, uh, or is it, is it government leaders? Because we've also seen a little bit of uh, you know, televised discussions between tech entrepreneurs and government leaders that didn't paint the best picture of what our government leaders are necessarily um, capable of understanding or currently understand. Uh, so can we train people on how to identify misinformation or does, misinformation as it exists actually stop us from doing that. Anyone can take the floor? I'll pass. Um, I, I def definitely think that we can spot or we can train people to spot misinformation. And I think, you know, Casey put it very well that we need to start this um, in the family, but also in education at beginning levels. Uh, but as Stephen pointed out, there's violence that's occurring right now in communities because of you know the spread of misinformation. So if we just end up targeting uh, newcomers to the digital age and don't focus on our world leaders, we don't focus on uh, you know our community leaders and we don't focus on adults and seniors, then we run the risk that this violence and these health and safety issues will still be widespread. And what kind of world is, you know, the newcomer to the digital age going to, you know, go into if uh, people are dead and, and things are destroyed before they even get a chance to say, hey guys, this is fake. It brings me to another question before you chip in, if you do answer is also um, maybe identifying who the we is, the, who, who should be the educator and the student. Yeah, I, you know, I think if I may, just to take a bit of a step back, you know, I, I really identify with um, what Casey uh, mentioned about family members and this kind of thing. And it's one one of those things that my friends keep on complaining about. You know, old, older generation doesn't know how to use stuff, blah, 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 that kind of thing. It's, it, it happens. Um, it seems to me that we um, are... In a, in a time where a huge leaps in technology, in communication are made at the same time where uh, the world is getting really, really small. And in places like Toronto, for example, um, where, where I am, you know, we're at an unprecedented pace of throwing all kinds of people together into one uh, polity or one social uh, space. And that comes, you know, Canada loves to pat itself on the back a lot of time because it has a lot of that in the United States perhaps uh, as well. Um, and, you know, that is assumed to be uh, purely, you know, that diversity is taken for granted as an unassailable good without really thinking about, you know, what kind of efforts do we have to make in terms of fostering mutual trust between different kinds of people who because of you know, how prevalent WeChat is, how prevalent WhatsApp is and the internet in general are bringing in a lot of their uh, concerns, a lot of their uh, you know, um, rivalries with different, uh, different groups into 
the places that they move into. So when I, you know, uh, hear, for example, my members of my family say that they, you know, this particular source is no good, or that this particular source is good, they're not technically always looking at the content or, or judging it based on the, uh, you know, the whether it's CNN or, or whatever solely, but it's they're basing it on who they trust. Like if it's from X group, then they don't trust them. If it's from Y group, then okay, maybe I can trust them. So I, I really think, you know, beneath this uh, technical abilities of being able to use uh, the internet or whatever the case may be, and, you know, knowing what to trust and what not to trust, that's very, very important. Below it, I think, you know, this problem is arising out of uh, people not being on the same page information-wise because they simply have blocks and blocks of people that they group together who they just label as no good. And that I think is supposedly, you know, apparently our elected leaders are supposed to help with melting that, but uh, that's not really the case these days. Um, um, absolutely, and Casey, unless you wanna add something, I think you're, you're, you're correct, Stephen. And it's not the case. In fact, it appears that oftentimes the leaders are, not only uh, helping spread positive information, but maybe using media as a tool to to get reelected, and yeah, and that means now who who can we trust? Um, to kind of go back to that video, I thought it was really interesting with the Facebook whistleblower. Even she she actually talks about how you know, if we're looking at globally each country, um, how social media sites or publishers or these different people could really help. Uh, there's a there's actually a language barrier, which I, I was, you know, I didn't even consider, uh, and the pace of which AI can produce algorithms that can even read the content being put out. Um, so my question is to you, do you, you know, people who work with futurists and entrepreneurs, uh, how fast could a problem like that be solved, do you think? Uh, and do we have really need to rely on the existing platforms to solve for it? Right. Or, or is it something new? And who's who's the one to choose that? That's the thing, <laughs> right? I mean, Netflix had a huge problem with Squid Games recently on the Korean translation of a TV show that was fictional. Um, and everybody on either side was complaining about it or had something to say about it. There was even other uh, subtitle files going around so you could uh, get it from a real Korean person or this person who lives in this part of Korea and this person who lives in LA, Koreatown and things like that. So that's the question is like, who is going to be the one to decide this? And that is, I think the problem, right? And like you said, the government, I'm not sure of that. So that's what, who is the third party that sits outside of all this um, and is so altruistic about it that can actually provide something that clear. I think that's really up to debate. And I mean, you also uh, showed me that John Oliver piece, right? And they really do point out to a lot of the uh, ones that don't speak English that have the um, biggest uh, problem, right? They, they don't they don't know who Dr. Fauci is. They don't think he's a real person, so they don't they don't want to believe in him. Uh, but they believe in some unknown guy because he speaks maybe he speaks Spanish or whatever or whatever other language there might be out there, right? I feel like that's a that's a tough question, and I I really don't have an answer for that. I mean, uh, AI we as the biggest discussions at, at the conferences about AI is that it's totally biased right now. It needs a lot of training to 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 see beyond things. Um, so I think we can't really let, leave it to technology either. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's, AI is basically, it only can create from what it's given. <laughs> so uh, something that, that was also brought up in that video uh, was suggesting that we slow tech down. We slow social media down until it can catch up. From your perspectives, is that even a possibility? No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm looking at the other uh, uh, the other uh, speaking speaking uh, panels happening at this event. A lot of them are on crypto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's never going to happen. If that you slow down all that too, that's impossible. Right, slow down communication, but increase digital currencies probably not not helpful. Uh, what about? Let's talk a little about about uh, deep fakes or uh, synthetic humans, right? Uh, we're already having a hard enough time trusting what someone says, uh, but are we also being faced now 
with this uh, problem of being able to trust if they're even people. Well, it was hard to even get, get my dad to believe that there was a thing called deep fakes. I showed him this uh, TikToker called uh, Deep Calm Cruise. If you haven't seen it, it's incredible. It's a normal looking guy who has maybe Tom Cruise's haircut. And then they use a you know, deep flake technology to put it on his face. So it looks like Tom Cruise and he does these 30 second hilarious videos. And I showed it to my dad and I'm like, hey, you know, this is not real. He's like, no, that's Tom Cruise. I'm like, no, it's not Tom Cruise. When's the last time you saw him? He doesn't look that young anymore. Right? <laughs> it's just, he's like a younger Tom Cruise. And then not until he saw the whole segment on 60 Minutes, uh, a news source that he trusts that he actually said, oh, that thing isn't real. I'm like, well, you don't trust your own son? I mean, no, you trust Mike Wallace or whoever is on there telling about that? That's quite interesting, though, that part of it. I feel like that. Um, so there you go. I, you know, if you want to have somebody who's going to tell older people what's real, maybe it's the older people who are studying this and waiting for it to hit a, a certain level of uh, acceptance in the, in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. I also have this fear of becoming the older person that doesn't know that they don't know. Right. Because we're, we're also going to age. And if tech's not slowing down, uh, I can't imagine our brains speed up with age. So there's always that that concern. Uh, I, I actually was on another panel earlier in the pandemic about synthetic humans. Uh, and they're becoming very popular in Asia. Primar uh, first is what it sounds like. Uh, they're pop stars and uh, cartoons. So you're talking about you know, deep fake v vloggers that the YouTube hosts are right. not real either anymore. So there, so there is potentially, you know, there's the older generation who maybe doesn't fully understand and is sharing all of this fake news or deep fakes. But then you have this other younger generation because us in the middle, we're perfect. I'm just kidding. Um, but the uh, younger generation who's growing up with deep fakes, uh, which could really become spokespeople for all kinds of information. Um, who's responsible for, or is anyone responsible for managing synthetic humans and their creation and their popularity? Do we let them just flow or, or, you know, should government say, should there be some sort of regulation around their existence? Uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, I actually attended a panel at Web Summit um, two years ago that was speaking about this particularly, and it had um, several creators of uh, AI and synthetic humans on the panel. And they all had mentioned that we are never going to get to a point where uh, synthetic humans and AI need to really reach a point of full oversight. Um, and that was just in 2019, but in 2019, the technology was so advanced that I was very confused about the way that they had, you know, uh, shared that their information. Uh, but now in 2021, when we see, you know, the spread of, of misinformation coming from a lot of these being specifically and people having a very large issue in you know, it, it's, it's, it's a brain issue because you're telling people that what they're seeing in front of them is not to be perceived as real. Um, and then it makes people question everything around them. You know, it's, it's as though people are realizing that they're living in the matrix. You know, how do you deal with something like that? So not only for the senior, um, you know, citizens, but also for, uh, you know, middle-aged people all over the world, this is a very big thing for them to understand and for them to kind of, realize that now they need to be, you know, not scared of, but be paying attention to like what is actually real in front of them and what is not. Um, but yeah, it was just interesting that it, at Web Summit, they, uh, the creators were saying that there doesn't need to be oversight when uh, clearly there needs to be. Um, but the question still stands, who? Yeah. Um, with, with the metaverse becoming a big thing now, right? So I've met a few startups that uh, created virtual um, influencers. So it's no longer good enough to be um, a pretty young girl living in Santa Monica, showing off uh, the ice cream you're eating and maybe the jeans you're wearing. Uh, they're trusting they're trusting people are not even real now because they won't age. And uh, I guess, I don't know, and they can transform their hair color faster or whatever. So I think, and then now these companies are being bought by metaverse companies who are going to be, uh, I guess, really promoting these characters into this new world. And they, some of them, they're not cartoons. They're not like uh, Pokemon. They're like, uh, they look like us or, you know, maybe like an 18 year old version of us. But the idea was that they are um, what you would consider influencers on Instagram today. This will be the Instagram influence of the future. Now they're, of course, they're influencing commercial consumer level buying, but you know, all you need is a virtual Alex Jones and uh, you know, what's going to happen there. We don't know. 
And also just to take into consideration the idea of, okay, so say governments start censoring. Well, we know governments are censoring, but you know, say uh, real humans are being censored and they're being, um, there's oversight in what they post. Is the same type of oversight going to be done um, on these synthetic humans or is it going to be their creators? Like, are we going to be holding real humans to a completely different standard than we're holding synthetic humans when synthetic humans are also playing a very large role in the spread of misinformation? It, it's just interesting to think about of, you know, where, where, where do we fall in that line? That's why I think the matrix would never really happen because there's all these questions. Those robots would never want to deal with this, right? They would just like not deal with this, creating that, that um, computer world. I, I actually have a really interesting question for the for journal, journalism or even event hosting. How, how do you cite a synthetic? How do you, I mean, you're already, you know, trying to build and write, or write stories that can be perceived as honest and true. Uh, is it, you know, what, what do you do if your source ends up being a synthetic human? I mean, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> you guys are retired by then. I know, we're sorry. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't necessarily believe that that's going to be something that in my work, I'm going to be needing to acknowledge in the next few years, um, just because I'm very strict with the sources that I use and the people that I speak to. But, uh, you know, as uh, synthetic humans take a larger role in society, that is a real question. And I don't have an answer to that. Stephen, do you? I would not cite a synthetic human. So, uh, I, you I won't think. even know, though. That's the question. That's yeah, the problem. The question is you won't even know if it's real or not. Yesterday, yeah. there was a new technology that was kind of revealed called Portal. It is a uh, vending machine size machine that can basically create a 4K image of you staying in another room talking to people. So it looks like there's a big box of light inside and I can be over here with a camera and talking to giving my delivering my keynote speech or my press conference and you can see it on the other side of the world. That line, that data line between me and the camera to that box can be hacked, right? Uh -huh. You never know what I'm gonna be saying in there. And then it looks like me and all my Press people are there, all my people are on your side. I think it's a, I mean, yeah, it's probably not going to happen for a few years, but wow, that's uh, it's kind of crazy. It, I mean, you, you have to get across that bridge when you get to it. I'm sure I don't envy the people who, who have to do this. Um, the These people who are coming up with this kind of technology, like you were saying, they only know one way and that's forward. Um, it's these are philosophical questions, I guess, you know, like who, who is what, what do you do? How do you know? Blah, blah, blah. Um, the rest of us, we have to take a step back and divest from some of these things and say like, if this space is too saturated with one kind of technology that we have no idea, we don't even understand it, then maybe we don't participate fully until we do. Mm -hmm. I think what we have like, generally, if, again, if I, if I zoom out a little bit, is this problem that's very ironic to me where, you know, all you hear all the time is, you know, people like Zuckerberg and others saying that uh, their technology and their platforms are primarily for making more meaningful connections at a time when I think more and more people feel like they're unmoored from their communities and living very uh, uh, sort of sidled lives and stuff like that. But at the very same time, he's under like indictment to speak in various in front of various governments who are who like up until a few years ago had no idea that they would be dealing with gigantic issues of their the very structures of their communities in Asia in particular uh, where that, that are changing drastically and are changing the politics of these countries and I'm just thinking, you know, the, the global budget of Facebook is primarily geared towards the United States, like over 80%. And yet only about 10% or so are users from the United States like uh, and North America globally of Facebook. So on the one hand, they're saying they, they play a huge role in bringing people together. But on the other hand, considering these deep fake things and that are you know, tech, the technology is there, synthetic human beings and AI of all sorts, you have 
you have these are weapons that various communities or groups who are are coalescing for whatever political reasons or sometimes extremist reasons, non-state actors and so on, they they're it's fair game for them to use this kind of thing once you put it out into the world. It could be dangerous groups, terrorism groups, etc., in the war uh, for information, which is I think the most important war over overall. Yeah, it's, it's interesting when you put it like that with uh, the war, the information war in, in the digital age, it's uh, it is quite intense. And journalists really uh, are sort of at the forefront of that. And I, I see it that way, primarily because it journalists does the writing. And even though it goes through checks and balances with editors and publishers and distribution, et cetera, uh, it's always the writer and the journalist uh, who takes the pressure, the heat and the focus, sometimes good and sometimes bad uh, when those words are put, are put out there. Uh, so I wonder from, from your perspectives, uh, do you feel uh, empo like empowered to write more now or, or are you a bit conflicted sometimes uh, about what you're putting out there? Jessica? Um, I don't think I am conflicted. I mean, obviously in the moment it, it changes, but, and I, I've been having these conversations actually a lot with um, journalists because I'm, I'm working on a series about journalists covering their own communities um, because in, in general, in classic, you know, journalist uh, history, that's been something that you you need to stay away from um but really in these communications or in these conversations that I'm having it it's coming out that journalists at their core you're either really good at your job or you're not you're either a really good journalist or you're not you're either ethically and morally sound or you're not um you have a good editor or you don't um you care about what you put out into the world or you don't there's not really necessarily gray areas um, as much so in, in, as in other realms. Um, so me personally, no, I don't think that I'm worried about what I'm putting out in a new way because I am always super, you know, conscious about what I'm putting out in general. So what I'm going to do isn't necessarily going to change on my side, other than I'm just going to be a lot more strict with my fact checking, my use of sources where I'm going for resources, what publications I'm working with. Um, yeah. I also want to just chime in there on that. I'm, I'm not a writer, but at all our conferences, we have uh, journalists as moderators for all the panels because I feel like they're able to, yeah, they have fact checking. They also hear the story from different uh, sources before they come on stage. And also uh, the best thing is obviously they're very cynical about it, right? <laughs> Somebody's coming up there and we're putting rockets into space. Okay, uh, let's go, let's scale it back. Let's talk really about how's that going to affect the world? Um, you know, all this crypto mining, how's it going to affect the environment? You know, all the excitement of technology, like, you know, like Stephen was saying, yeah, people like, you know, that's that motto of Mark Zuckerberg, move fast and break things. That is not, uh, that is, that was, that's fun for entrepreneurs because that's what you're trying to do, disrupt a lot of things, but the real world doesn't work that way. And uh, now we're really seeing a big pullback, right? And one of the biggest um, mm -hmm. topics at the conferences now is all about um, impact, right? It's like, how does it hurt the environment, that side, side of the things, right? Which I also would like to put in this whole uh, thing that we're discussing today as well. You know, that I think anything impact uh, is, is changing the, the, the world, the people's minds, things like that. So um, I do think I do like the fact that we do have journalists come in and uh, I do I love some of them super cynical interviewing <laughs> some of the big uh, CEOs out there and it's really good. And I think it's that's what makes the, the talk so interesting as well. It's not just, you know, me interviewing somebody. I'm like, yeah, that sounds so cool. Let's, let's get on a rocket to the moon to Saturn together. That sounds great. It's more like, uh, yeah, what does that mean to the rest of the world? And I think that's something that we always have to take a look at when looking at all this new technology and even just our day to day interaction with our smartphones. Absolutely. Stephen, did you want to add? No, I, I mean, I think the I'm surprised to hear, I'm glad to hear that there's a recoil of like uh, in, in that space in particular among tech entrepreneurs. Um, it is uh, high time that 
these people, uh, whoever they are, uh, that we all don't operate in silos with a tunnel vision. Because whether you like it or not, I mean, you depend, we depend on each other for, for money and business, but also whatever success you want to attain, whether it's in journalism or whatever else, you know, the, these are whatever solutions there are, you know, if I want to get story ideas, if I want to place a story, these are, I need people solutions. So nobody can, whether you're in tech or whatever, if you're responsible for the next uh, app or whatever the case may be, of course, the societal things are coming are coming towards you, and you have to you have to consider them because ultimately, what can you do, right? You, you need people to find solutions for your problems. I like that, we all have uh, hold a certain level of responsibility uh, to ourselves and to each other. And you know, to circle back to sort of the first uh, piece of this panel, when you get that text message from your father, or your uncle or whomever it is, uh, you know, taking the time to, to, to call and speak, talk to them about it and, and really be interested in, in why they care. But you're absolutely right. It's at the, it, the individual level, it's most imperative uh, that we start acting more like those journalists we put on stage and start asking lots of hard questions and remaining endlessly interested. And the three of you uh, with the varying backgrounds and insights, it's, just great to hear you know you're, you're you're talking to these world leaders and futurists all the time uh, so if you have any any closing comments and also please let everyone here know how they can get in touch with you if they have you know questions or just feel like reaching out and uh, i'll start with you jess yeah um i mean closing comments i, I feel like you know we really beat it in this is a, an individual and a community issue just as much as it, is a, as it is a national and global and tech platform issue. All levels need to be involved and we need to figure out what that looks like and we need to figure out fast what that looks like. Um, but we can all start at an individual level by having conversations, by seeing even you know what we're putting out, um, what we're participating in. So individuals really need to step up um, and then have those conversations with family members and friends and and start to train even loosely in the community. Um, you can find me on uh, Twitter. I'm at Jess Kantrowitz, um, K-A-N-T-R-O-W-I-T-Z. And you can email me if you really need to um, at jessica at bellivy.com. Great, thanks. I'm gonna pass to Steven. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, part of the reason that people are, I think, really um, forced, forcing themselves and staying in a lot of these information silos or cocoons is based on a um, mistrust of quote unquote mainstream media, which is not a single thing. It's many, many things. Um, one thing that journalists, I think, are probably going to have to do, and I think it's, it's incumbent upon us to do, is for our media outlets, the outlets we work for and ourselves to show people how we do our jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, here in Toronto, various outlets are starting to do that. Like how did they, this uh, story come together? How did these pieces of information come together? Who did you interview and so on and so forth? The everyday ins and outs of um, news production, be it television or whatever else, I think that, that has to be done now because people have such mistrust. It's like every survey is 60%, is 70%. You don't trust what you see on television, so on and so forth. That skepticism is fine, but we can all be more transparent in terms of just showing people that, okay, we have a process in place. It's not perfect, but there are fact checkers in place and they're just human beings. Secondly, I think this has to be done in, in conjunction along with other similar campaigns with local governments. If you can't expect your uh, governor or your premier or whatever to do, to, to take a step forward on these issues or the prime minister or your federal government, uh, I mean, we don't always have to think in such sort of um, broad terms. We can focus on what's happening in our own communities. And various campaigns have to happen now in terms of how different communities get their information and like what what are the gaps and where are the gaps of mistrust without that there's no technical fix 
That's so true. Local communities. What are the thing that we tend to overlook because we're all listening to the same stories. Thank you so much, Stephen. I really love that ending note. And uh, Casey, please finish this the day. Oh, uh, Stephen, I'm sorry. Where can people find you? Oh, yeah. Uh, feel free to tweet me or DM me on Twitter um, at Stephen with a V, uh, Z-Z-H-O-U. Great. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to close off, I just want to echo what everybody else has already said. It's great stuff. I guess for me, the, the one thing I want to see, uh, if anything comes out of this and people are listening, you know, we had Al Gore come to Web Summit, brought the house down, and his talk was all about thinking about the environment as you develop your future uh, startups and your new products and things like that. I, I hope there's somebody out there that maybe is going to take the, the, instead of always having to be an Edward Snowden or a Francis Haugen, somebody out there who will, will be kind of be a, a leader for misinformation and, and reminding everybody that it's very important to be part of. Um, and also just a plea to um, parents, um, you know, when you're sending your kids to like an after school class, maybe you, you just hook into an hour class on just learning a little bit about how this, uh, how data is transmitted, how information is transmitted, just so you know a little bit more about it rather than just leave it to the teachers kind of thing. Because uh, I think that's something that's very important going forward for all of us. And uh, I'm on Twitter as well, Casey underscore Lau. You can email me at Casey at riseconf.com. Thank you everyone uh, for joining today. Uh, we will, uh, this, this session uh, is going to be available uh, throughout the entire conference. So if you missed it live, please feel free to join later. Uh, and again, reach out to any of our panelists if you have additional questions. Thank you very much again. I'm eternally grateful uh, for you joining in from all of these different locations. And I hope to see each of you very soon. Thanks. Yeah.